the Dart Zone Pro Mark III, the Foam Pro Tour, and what's next for this channel. We've got a lot to talk about today, so let's jump right into it. So kicking off the video, today we're going to be doing a light review of the Dart Zone Pro Mark III. Now, this blaster did come out several months ago, but the reason we're going to be covering it now is because it's going to be a baseline for the performance increases we're going to do in our mod guide, and because it has relevance to the upcoming Foam Pro Tournament that we'll also be talking about in this video. Now, looking at this blaster, it does come with some accessories. A detachable and adjustable stock with a rubber pad that attaches to a standard buffer tube. We've got a faux red dot sight powered by two AAA batteries. It only has one switch here on the side to turn it on or off. We've got a length of Picatinny rail across the entirety of the top of the blaster. We've got an additional Picatinny rail across the bottom of the blaster here for like a foregrip or a flashlight or something. We've also got somewhat of a built-in foregrip to the front. Our rev trigger, because it is a flywheel blaster, and this rubberized grip. It also looks to be very sufficiently cooled in the area where the flywheels are. This blaster does run on AA batteries and it takes eight of them. It is also select fire with a full auto and semi-auto settings. No burst fire or anything fancy like that. Moving on to magazines, this blaster does take full length and half length darts, so it comes with a 15 round mag of each. When I loaded up darts into the magazine, I got exactly 15 darts in here, with no room for any other ones, so it's exactly what it says it is. When it came to the half length one, I was actually able to fit a couple extra, so that's pretty cool, but I wouldn't push your luck, it's probably designed this way for a reason, and it may cause premature wear to add extra darts. In order to accept half length magazines, it does come with an adapter. Just across from the rev trigger, there is a magazine release trigger, which will release the entire magazine. When using the half length adapter, you'll need to use magazine release on the actual adapter in order to pull out your half length magazine. The magazine adapter is also compatible with worker talent mags right out of the box. However, there are some feeding issues, and we'll be talking about the solutions to that problem in just a moment. The mag adapter does have a dual catch system, so although I don't have a Katana jet mag to show you guys, it does in fact take those as well. You can also use any of your existing full length magazines that are Nerf branded or aftermarket ones like the Worker Banana Mags. This blaster can also accept the Out of Darts Tachi Mags because they have the same catch point as the Worker Mags. However, this doesn't suffer from the feeding issue that the Worker Mags do because they have a wider feed lip. To solve this problem, you're going to need to sand down the feed lip on your worker mags just barely in order to stop this problem. You may not experience it at all, and in that case, I would just move on. Moving on to the second issue is that sometimes the pusher arm can pull back the darts with this adapter. So there is a 3D printed solution that I'll link down below. It's very simple to install. All you do is unscrew the four screws here, pull this, uh, pull the cover off of the top, lay the 3D printed piece into the middle here, close it back up and put those four screws back. Very simple. I highly recommend that you do this even if you have no intention to modify the blaster any further. In addition to that, I would say one more creature comfort that you should do whether you plan to modify this blaster or not is to replace the screw on the battery cover right here with a thumb screw. That way, if you need to change batteries on the field, you don't have to have a screwdriver do that. You just twist this thing by hand and then you have access to the battery door. Both of these solutions can be purchased for very, very cheap at Out of Darts website. I'll link them down below. Now, in order to set a baseline for future modifications, as well as to just review the blaster on its own two feet, we're gonna go ahead and get started with an FPS test. All right, we're gonna be kicking off the FPS test with 10 rounds of the bamboo darts that it came with. These are the new ones. 135, 138, 132, 131, 132, 133, 132, it sounded like he shot two that time, 128, duplicate 128, and that's it. Alright, next up is the full length darts that it came with, these are also the new ones, not the regular bamboos that came with the Mark II. And this one sucks. This is probably messing up the water testing to some degree. Nine, 
137, 140, 139. Duplicate 139 and I hit the photograph. 140, duplicate 140, and that's it. In my testing, and with the full length bamboos that were included with the blaster, we're hitting an average in the low 130s which is a very high number for a stock blaster. Pitted up against the performance of a flywheel blaster from Nerf, this thing is shooting almost twice as hard. Using the included half-length bamboo darts, we were hitting in the low 140s. I know others have tested and had a different result, but for whatever reason, I'm getting better performance with my half-length bamboo darts. All right, now let's talk accuracy. Now, flywheelers are not known for their accuracy to begin with, but we're gonna go ahead and take it out there and see what happens. Alright, so it's really windy. We're going to do an accuracy test. Um, unfortunately, I just think that the wind is really going to mess with us here. So this is going to be a take it with a grain of salt type thing. We're going to go five full length and then we're going to do five half length. We're going to start out with the full length. That's from 50 feet. That's a hit. That's a miss. That's a miss. That's a hit, that's a miss. All right, so two hit, three miss, a lot of wind. Honestly, for a flywheel with full length, that's not terrible. All right, next up, we're gonna be doing our half length. I'm hoping to get a little more accuracy from these, um, but the wind being what it is, you know, again, take it with a grain of salt. Can't forget to turn on the uh, sick optic. That was a near miss. The wind literally blew it straight down at the end. Hit. Miss. Hit. Hit. Okay, so as you can see, Full length ammo is less accurate than half length ammo, and I'm sure that's no surprise. But I will say that with the wind conditions and the fact that this is a flywheel blaster, hitting three out of five shots on semi-auto is actually pretty good in my opinion. Now let's talk about range. This blaster doesn't have an advertised range on the box like the Nexus Pro or the Max Striker or some of Dart Zone's other creations that you can buy in store. However, because this is a pro blaster, even though this is a flywheeler and those are springers, I do expect something similar in terms of results. But let's get out there and see what happens. All right, so we're gonna be doing a range test. I've got this uh, tape measure set here to 120 something feet. We're gonna shoot five half length on one side, full length on the other side. We're gonna compare them. It is still a little bit windy, but not quite as much as earlier, so. Hopefully we can knock this out before the wind decides to uh, mess with our results again. All right, shooting our full length. First shot is gonna be a straight across. Second, straight across. We're gonna bump up the angle. We're gonna bump up the angle even further. And we're gonna straight up just give it like a 45 degree. Ooh, that one really went sailing. All right, now we're gonna do a straight across shot on the left side for the half length. This is gonna be very level. All right, we're gonna do one more of those. All right, we're gonna increase the angle up a little bit. Ooh, we're gonna increase it a little more. That one caught the wind for sure. Now we're gonna try to max it out, like pretty much a 45 degree angle. All right, now uh, let's go find him. What are you doing? Oh, it went further? Oh crap, all right, he had to extend it because it went further than 120 feet. I was not expecting that. We'll see where it actually goes. All right, we've got, looks like, Half length number one and half length number two here at 68 feet. All right, we got full length number one, about 80 feet. Full length number two 
at about 83 feet. We got another half length, the one that got caught by the wind, over here at 110 feet. Oh, and here's another one right there, half length. All right, we got uh, our next full length over here at about 115 feet. And then the last one over here, oh, 117 feet, actually. All right, and then we got our Hail Mary shots. All the way out here, we've got the full length Hail Mary, and that is right about 134 feet. Our last half length shot right here, sitting right about 140 feet. Man, that is, that's surprising. I was not expecting that. Well, I'm actually pretty shocked overall that we got something over 120 feet. It performed as good, if not better, than my expectations. Now let's talk about price. This blaster retails for $129, and that is expensive for a stock blaster. However, I think it's important to take into consideration that this blaster performs at the level of a modified blaster. And when you take into account the modifications it would take to take something similar, like a Strife, to buy it, put the parts in, and the labor to get it in there, I think this is a reasonably priced blaster. Plus, there's a lot of innovative designs in this blaster, like the fact that it has two separate systems, one for its semi-automatic, which gives you a mechanical trigger pull, and one for its fully automatic that gives you an electronic trigger. Dirt Zone is really listening to the community, and I think it's important we take that into consideration when we look at the price. Another thing I want to talk about is the fact that this blaster has a ton of modding potential. You'll see this when we're modifying the blaster in the future, but if you open up the battery tray and unscrew the single screw holding it in, you'll find an XT60 connector so that it can be LiPo powered which is something I haven't seen on any other store-bought blaster. The other thing is that there's 18 gauge wire running through the entire blaster. Not only is, does it have the connector to take a LiPo battery, but it is pre-wired for it, which will save you a ton of time should you choose to modify it. My overall thoughts on the blaster are obviously glowingly positive. I think the high price tag can be a barrier to entry, but if you have the money, I really don't think you can go wrong by grabbing. I will say it's also important to note that since this is exclusive to Target, Target has sales periodically that this blaster is eligible for. And that's how I got mine. So if you're waiting for the right opportunity, you can get 20% off this blaster or other similar discounts. In addition to that, if you don't already have a Target credit card, there are periods of time where you can open a Target credit card and they'll give you a $40 credit which is in fact stackable with the other discounts that I mentioned earlier. By combining these two discounts, instead of paying the $129.99 plus tax, which turns out to roughly $149, I paid only $75 tax included for this blaster because I picked the right time to buy it. And at $75, I couldn't possibly recommend anything else. Moving on to our second topic of the video, the Foam Pro Tour. Now the Foam Pro Tour, also known as the Dart Zone Pro Tour, is basically a two-part event. So what this is, is a competitive Nerf tournament. There are other channels receiving care packages and releasing some information about the tournament itself, but I haven't seen any of them go into detail about the tournament and the rules. So I think that's what we're gonna go for here. Let's start out with the structure. There are four qualifying events that together make up the Foam Pro Tour. Teams moving on from these four qualifying events will compete against each other in the finals known as the Dart Zone Pro Tournament, which will be taking place alongside NWAR, the HVZ, or Humans vs. Zombies, nerf event. So let's talk about the qualifiers. So the first qualifier for this tournament actually already took place on November 21st in Florida. And depending when you see this video, the second qualifier may have also taken place, but it is set to take place on April 23rd in New Jersey. The third qualifier is set to take place in California on May 14th. And the fourth and final qualifier will be taking place in Rochester, New York on July 14th. The top two teams from each of these qualifiers will move on to the finals, which will also be in Rochester, New York on July 17th. There's information split between the website for the Foam Pro Tour and on Dart Zone's website. So I'll link both down below so you can look over some of this stuff for yourself. But we're gonna start out by going over the details on Dart Zone's website. If you scroll down on their homepage and click on the details for the Dart Zone Pro Tournament, you'll see a page where they have a video promo for the event. Underneath that video promo, they have a description. I'm gonna read that description to you now. Bringing a new meaning to hashtag only one pro. In 2022, we'll be putting an end to discussions about whose foam flinging team really holds the title of champion. 
We've partnered with Foam Pro Tour and Drac the Lassa to host qualifiers across the count across the country, looking for the top 40 players to compete over the $15,000 in prize money in the first ever Dart Zone Pro tournament. As part of the finals, we'll supply the top eight teams exclusively with our pro line of blasters, leveling the playing field and ensuring gamemanship and ability to determine who comes out on top. So there's a lot to unpack there. $15,000 for a nerf tournament is insane. This is the most money we've ever seen in the sport. And I think it's a good sign that the sport is growing and that competitive nerfing or dart soft as some people are rebranding it has a promising future. Scrolling down across their page, it shows a jersey for each qualifier. Now, there are two different designs. I can only imagine that each design is for first and second place. Below this description, there are a picture of different colored jerseys, the locations of the, each qualifier, and some of the prize money distribution details. For each qualifier, it shows that each first place team will take a $1,000 cash prize. It also says that first place team will receive first place team jerseys, as well as a travel voucher. There aren't any further details on that. Second place will also receive the qualifier second place team jersey. On their site, they do show that each qualifier has a different color and that first and second place have different designs within that color for their jerseys. Florida is red, New Jersey is blue, California is green, and New York is orange. Scrolling further down the page, we get details about the prize system for the finals. It says that first place takes home a $10,000 cash prize, second place takes home a $4,000 cash prize, and third place takes home a cash prize of $1,250. Below that, we get some details about tournament blasters. It says here, prepare to conquer the competition with a full line of Dart Pro Series Mark Foam Blasters. The finalists in Dart Zone Pro Tournament will be hitting the field with the best out-of-the-box retail pro blasters on the market. Underneath this, it shows three blasters, which are the three blasters you'll be able to use in the finals. The Dart Zone Pro Mark III, which we covered earlier in this video, the Dart Zone Pro Mark II, which is a spring-powered pistol, and the Dart Zone Pro Mark 1.1. This is also a spring-powered blaster, but is much larger and is mag-fed. It does say below this that players in all four qualifiers and the finals are required to be over the age of 14. Any players 14 to 17 years of age are also required to have a legal guardian to consent to participate. So sorry guys, if you're younger than 14 by the time that your qualifier takes place, you won't be able to participate. Moving on to the Foam Pro Tours page, we're going to go over some of the rules and some of the details because it seems that those blasters will only be provided for the finals. Qualifiers have a different set of specifications, and we'll go over that as they come up in the rule set. Taking the rules directly from the Foam Pro Tour page, which will also be linked down below, there are 13 official rules. Rule number one, players and referees, hosts, TOs, should conduct themselves professionally and treat others with respect. Violations constitute ejections from the event. This may force a team to forfeit their matches. So basically, come with a good attitude, it's a game, and although it's competitive, you still need to be a good sport. Rule number two, a match consists of a series of time games between two teams of equal players, usually three or five, until a team reaches two points scored via elimination or timeout. Elimination occurs when all players on a team are hit slash tagged, awarding the remaining team one point and ending the round. A timeout occurs when the game clock hits zero, ending the round with a whistle or horn as a signal. The team with more players remaining is awarded one point. So until now, I was actually under the impression that it was going to be five on five. But this rule actually clarifies that it doesn't have to be five on five. It could be three on three or some other number. I'm not sure how they're going to determine this or if it's just meant for special cases like ties. Another important detail is that a match consists of multiple rounds. And that's important because it's not just one and done. There is an element of chance in foam flinging and having multiple rounds to go against the same team really minimizes the element of chance in determining a victor. Rule number three, play begins at the end of a five count and the start of a signal, which is going to be a whistle or horn, and it lasts two minutes. All players must have their blaster in contact with their respective starting line, clearly identified by the TO and or referees, and may not move until the count is finished and the signal set. A referee, host, or TO may request a restart to any round in which this is violated. Repeated violations at the discretion of a ref, host, or TO will award a point to the non-offending team. Okay, so a couple details here. Rounds are going to last for two minutes, and if you jump the starting line, you could get a reset or let your opponent take a free point. Rule number four, 
Ammo for each player is capped at 10 times the number of opponents in a given match and is all the ammo that may be used for the entirety of the match, barring a draw. No scavenging is allowed, but ammo may be shared between team members between rounds. Okay, so this is important. Although it'll most likely be a 5-on-5 five -five match, there are other situations that they are accounting for, such as a 3-on-3 three -three like they mentioned. So how they've divided the rules is that how many of our players you're facing times 10 equals the amount of ammo that you can have per player on your team. If it's 5-on-5, five -five, because they have 5 players, you can have 50 ammo. And since there's five players on your team, your team as a whole should be able to have 250. But you don't have to divide that up evenly. Another interesting thing about ammunition in this rule is that it specifies that you can switch ammo between rounds. This implies that you will not be allowed to replenish the amount of darts you start with while facing off against that team unless you draw. So theoretically, if you're going off against five people, each player should average about 50 darts, but you need to divide that up against the three rounds. Should you end up using more than about 15 or so darts in the first two rounds, you'll be setting yourself up to run out of ammo in your final rounds, just something to be aware of. Rule number five, if a match somehow ends in a draw, each team must select a single player, issue 10 pieces of ammo to play a 1v1 match with a one minute timer and any other method the host or tournament organizer deems appropriate to advance the event or tournament. So okay, so they have thought of an alternate way to decide matches should there be a draw. 1v1 is something I think none of us were really expecting, which means if you are training for the event, you will need to probably train each player individually and not just your team as a whole. 10 pieces of ammo is also not a lot, so I imagine you're really going to need to pick your shots there. Rule number six. A tag is any ammo that contacts a player, including the player's gear or blaster, without interference after being propelled from a blaster, or a player steps or dances out of bounds. Examples of interference include hitting cover, a wall, the ground, bystanders, trees, etc. Note, ammo mid-flight, hitting other ammo mid-flight is not considered interference. Okay, so if someone were to shoot the ground, bounce up and hit you, it wouldn't count. However, this is a good time to Take note that you should probably be minimizing on gear. The more gear you have, the bigger target that you are. So stick to what's important, what you'll really need, and try not to include anything else, even if it looks really cool. I will say it seems like they've thought of everything at this point, because I would have never considered the possibility of ammo hitting each other mid-flight. Rule number eight, teams should swap sides between rounds. That one seems pretty straightforward. Rule number nine, eye protection is required for all players and bystanders within 50 feet of the play area. This is another important one. I think this was this one's very straightforward and obvious, but nobody wants to do something so serious as lose an eye over a foam dart game. Rule number 10, if playing in a setting that requires registration, two alternates may be included on a roster, which may be substituted between rounds. Ammo count must be maintained and thus alternates inherit the ammo remaining of the player they subbed in for. So that's interesting, although the rules don't specify the max amount of team members or that you'll actually be required to register, this rule covers the case of what if. And in this case, assuming that the max amount of people is five, that means you'll actually be allowed to roster seven people and that you can alternate them between rounds, which might be good for minimizing fatigue or for players that are more suited to attack the play styles of their opponents. But should the person you're subbing out for only have a few pieces of ammo or possibly none, you would get only what they have left. Left. Rule number 11. The field requires two starting lines, measured and marked in parallel to each other at the short end of the play area. The field should be twice as long as it is wide, 100 feet by 50 feet, for example. The field boundaries must also be clearly marked and communicated to players. Okay, so basically your side of the field, whichever side that may be, is going to be square, and two squares put together will make up the entirety of the field, although the exact measurements are not specific. Rule number 12. Cover is not required for a game, but if available, it should be placed by the referees, hosts, or TO. Cover pieces should be of identical construction and not placed within 30 feet of the starting line. This one's big. It leaves them room to not have any cover at all, despite the fact that in previous years running the foam tour, there's always been cover. It'd be very interesting to see if that were to happen, and I think it's important to strategize for every possibility, including the fact that field layouts may not be the same from match to match. The one definitive measurement we have for field layouts though in this rule 
is that the starting line has to be a minimum of 30 feet away from the first piece of cover. And that is the only definitive piece of measurement that we've gotten so far about the field layout. Rule number 13, blasters of any sufficient quality and deemed safe by the host slash TO and within the following parameters may be used. Spring powered FPS cap of 250, flywheel powered FPS cap of 200, melee shields and throwables are prohibited. Flashlights, laser pointers are also prohibited. Homemade ammo is, is pro prohibited. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by, by homemade ammo. It could possibly include full lengths being cut down into half lengths, though I'm not 100% sure on that. Realistically, if you want to play it safe, it seems like you're going to have to bring your own ammo. And if you do, you should bring something that's store bought, like AF Pros, Dart Zone Max Darts, Worker Darts, or something along those lines, just to play it safe. In addition to that, there's a there's a small paragraph in the rule section afterwards that isn't a numbered rule. It says, formal rules for the top eight to follow. Blasters and ammo will be provided by name sponsor for qualifying team use. Qualifying teams will have an identical pool of blasters to choose from before each match for use in the top eight games. So we went over the details of that and what blasters will be available earlier in the video. But now that I'm reading this section, it sheds a little extra light. A pool of blasters is not the same as you getting to pick from those three blasters. It's very possible that they'll have a limited number for each blaster available. Now we know for sure there will be multiples because there are only three types of blasters and there are five possible players. And I'm going to make a prediction here on what the pool is going to be. Don't take my word for it, but I think that the most likely outcome is that we're going to see two of each blaster. And the reason I think this is because if five players choose from six blasters, there is no way that a team could walk on the field without having one of each blaster at least. In addition to that, if you go through Dart Zone's page and you watch the trailer for the Dart Zone Pro Tournament, you can see multiple times a player dual wielding the Mark II pistols, which would align perfectly for two players having to choose the Mark III another two players having to choose the Mark 1.1, and the final player having two the Mark II pistols. Again, this is just a theory. We'll see how this pans out. If you scroll over to the prize page, you'll be able to see what looks like the first place winners from the first qualifier. And judging by the picture on their jerseys, the team seems to be labeled Beef Squad. There is no mention of the second team player, but they are holding a $1,000 check and the jersey that has more red in the pattern from the previous page we discussed, which makes me believe that that is the first place jersey and that the one with mostly gray and accents of red is the second place jersey. All in all, I, can, I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to participate in this. Although the Foam Pro Tour happened in the past, I was not able to participate in the previous year and this will be the first year with a title sponsor providing such a huge cash prize. Like I mentioned before, I think it means a lot of great things for the hobby and the future of the hobby, and that Dart Zone, as well as other companies, will be more involved in the coming years. Now moving on to our final topic, some of the things that you can look forward to seeing on this channel. Now, as I mentioned before, I'll be participating in the Foam Pro Tournament, and as you could probably guess by my shirt, the name of the team that I'll be competing with is Nebula. I'm excited to work with the other members of my team and hopefully bring you some gameplay footage in the future. This is a brand new team and not a veteran team like some of the other teams that'll be competing. So it'll be interesting to see how we fare. I'll also be doing my first modification guide very shortly here. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, the blaster that we'll be modifying is the Mark III. Now I don't want to get into too much details, but I want to say, but I do want to say that I'm very excited about this modification guide because it's gonna have an emphasis on both high performance and ease of installation. I know that modifying blasters can be overwhelming for a lot of people, and it was certainly an intimidating experience to get into for me. We'll also be working on reviewing some accessories in the future, and I'm really excited to introduce both of these new categories to the channel, but I'd like to hear from you guys. So let me know down in the comments, have you participated in the Foam Pro Tour before? Are you going to participate now? If you do go, I look forward to seeing you there, and I hope you have a blast. And of course, I'll see you in the next video. Until next time, on the King of Games.